Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Voices of Recovery. I'm your host, Michelle Ike, and every week I interview someone who has overcome a life controlling issue with God's help. And this week I have two guests. I have Lori and her sister, Lisa. Welcome to the show, ladies. Welcome. Thank you. You're very welcome. So Lori is the author of the book, The Pawn. And this is her story of um, overcoming some very difficult situations as a child. So we'll be talking about the book here in a minute. But first, I want you ladies to just introduce yourself to the audience. Tell us a little bit about yourself. And we'll start with you, Lori, and then we'll move over to your sister, Lisa. Okay. First of all, I want to say thank you very much for having us on the show and giving us the opportunity to share our story and give us a voice. So I thank you for that, Michelle. No problem. I've been looking forward to this interview for some time. Thank you. Okay. So anyways, my name is Lori Jean Jones and I am the author of The Pawn, The Curse Becomes a Blessing. I'm a California native. I'm married, a mother of three adult children. Um, I enjoy some of my hobbies is I really enjoy purchasing and reading uh, books from Igniting Souls authors. Um, and I mean, I just have a passion for that because I know how hard it is to write a book and yeah. I just want to give it much um, support and encouragement to all of our authors out there. Um, so that's one thing I definitely enjoy to do. Another thing is I love Zumba, but you mm. can't tell because I'm pudgy in the pandemic right now, but I can't wait uh, to start getting back with my crew and, and getting my exercise on. Yeah. Nice. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Well, thank you for that, Lori. And Lisa, this is Lori's sister, Lisa. Uh, so tell us a little yes. bit about yourself. Um, I, my name is Lisa, Lisa Joy. Um, I'm married. Um, I have no children. Um, I work in retail for many years. And my hobbies are flowers. I like mm. to do uh, flower arrangements and stuff like that. Very nice. That's awesome. She's really good at it too. I bet. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, it's great to have you two ladies on the show today. And uh, before we dive in, I just want the audience to know that we are going to be discussing abuse. So um, Lori wrote in her book, The Pawn, about the physical, sexual, and emotional abuse that she endured as a child. So it is a sensitive subject. Um, Lori is also going to share about her addiction and kind of how that started. So I just want to let you know, um, this is a very important topic to discuss and we want you to stay with us. But if you have young children in the room, these topics would not be suitable for them. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. So Lori, um, you sent me a copy of your book and we connected through the mutual author page that we both belong to. And I told you earlier, I could not put it down. I mean, Aww. this is not a thin <laughs> book, guys. And I had it completely done in three days. It was so compelling. I, I just, I was like, okay, I'm just going to read one more chapter. I'm just going to read two more chapters, three more chapters. I'm telling my husband, go get carry out. The laundry's piling up. It was so worth it because seriously i mean it just is that good and oh, just right you. from the start you just had me you had me hooked so uh, well done well done and Same i do thing. a lot of reading and uh this this was probably a record for me to finish it so quickly but i i loved it um and so uh you, you start out talking about going into labor with your son you had been using drugs at the time and so there were some issues with with his health and whatnot and like i said you just grabbed me because I, I wanted to know what happened and i had so many thoughts going through my mind and one of those was you know it almost almost a judgmental thought and i i'm i'm sorry for it but you know how can you use drugs when you're pregnant <laughs> you know um but through the rest of the book the way you unpack it all you start with a present moment situation and then you go back in time to your childhood and it's just so incredibly well done so do you want to share any thoughts on that just as we get started here 
Well, yeah, and 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 I decided to share that way because um, it is it's it's a topic that people need to be aware of. There's a lot, you know. Nobody grows up, Michelle, and says, "Hey, I want to be a drug addict when I get big." Right. And matter right. of fact, I want to do drugs when I'm pregnant. Nobody ever says that. Right. So, and my, my view is there's always a story behind an addict, behind everybody, we all have a story. And um, in my particular case, you know, I started smoking at the age of eight. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I had my first drink when my stepfather forced me to um, drink, I think it was probably Mad Dog 20, mm -hmm. 20 or Red Lady 21 or something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, what, I, on my birthday, and I passed out, I threw up in my vomit, and, you know, so alcohol was definitely not my drug of choice, let me tell you. Right. But then I, I started experimenting and got addicted to uh, crosstalk. So that's like a synthetic uh, methamphetamine when I was mm -hmm. nine years old. Wow. I mean, yeah, they're called crosstalk beanies. So let me tell you, at nine years old, and this carried on, so by the time I was in my early 20s, I was a full-blown addict, pregnant or not. I had no tools, none, to be able to get begin a recovery journey or even knew what that meant. So, um, yeah, and, you know, and I, I understand, just yes. Yeah, totally. And, you know, I just started so young in a culture that it was acceptable, you know. And right. I mean, I look at my granddaughter, Michelle, being 10, and it blows my mind right. that how on earth was I smoking two years and doing drugs like two years before her age right now. It's just unfathomable. I can't even believe it. Look, I went through it and I'm having a hard time believing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand mean, what you're saying, Lori. Yeah. So, um, so why, why did you write the book? Just because you want to okay. give a voice to people who had been abused or was there more to it? Well, there was a lot, it's kind of, it, there was multiple reasons, but I'll give okay. you the two main ones. Okay. Um, first of all, I wanted to use my life as an illustration for God's love, compassion, his mercy, Michelle, yeah. and his grace. Because listen, I made so many horrific mm. mistakes growing up in the decisions I made. And mm. I wanted to show that anything is possible with God. I mean, he could Amen. heal anybody at any time. And also I wrote this is to give not only a voice um, to abuse, but also that people will begin to understand, have a little bit more compassion and understand, right. not to give excuses, mm -hmm. but I want to bring awareness to what happens when children are abused at such a young age, or abused period, let's just say right. period. Right. And because I really feel like more than ever now, we need a lot more love and compassion and understanding in our world right now, Michelle. So, we do. I mean, it's twofold, you know. Um, so those are the Absolutely. two main reasons why I wrote it. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I can really connect with both of those, Lori, because mm -hmm. I... I too believe that nothing is impossible for God and he yeah. can transform any life. And that's what he did with my life. It's what he did with your life. And when I interview people, like I could do this all day, every day. Like I just love hearing the testimonies of people yeah. whose lives have been transformed by the power of God. And so yeah. that's why we're here. Um, so yeah. amen to that. And then, like you said, um, people don't understand. And just, just like I said, reading the book and finding out where you were as you're giving birth to your son in the hospital. And then let's flash back to when you were a very young child, things kind of started happening when you were two years old. So we'll, we'll go ahead and dive into that. But first I want to mm -hmm. ask Lisa if she has anything to contribute. Um, Lisa, how did you feel about Lori writing the book um, and bringing up topics that were probably painful to think about and relive? Um, I knew, I knew that she needed to go through this process mm -hmm. to help her healing and not only to help somebody else with the pain that she went through to turn it, flip it around to help somebody else. I, and love, that, that. I love that, Lisa, yeah. flip it around. 
That I just love my sis. I can see why you would want to bring her as your sidekick here. Here's the dynamic duo right here. You guys are awesome. God turns everything around for our good. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever we lost, he will give back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, yeah. That's incredibly yeah. encouraging. And I feel like there are a lot of people, and I'm praying they're going to watch the show who need to hear that. Mm -hmm. All right. So it sounds like um, things kind of started to go downhill when you were two, Lisa, and, or I'm sorry, Lori was two, and Lisa, you were on the way, and your father left your mom. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the way you explained it was that, you know, she kind of felt shame. She didn't want to be a single mom. This was the mid sixties, right? right? And there was kind of a little bit of a stigma there. Absolutely. Um, and she found somebody, right? And he was Mr. Wonderful, knight in shining armor coming Good in. Good yeah. Right, okay. Um, and so this was your stepdad, Rob. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, so t go ahead and talk a little bit about that and maybe some of your earliest memories. Um, you, you go into great detail about the physical and emotional abuse that you endured. Um, let's start with, can you share the Santa story? Because that one really stood out to me as far as just um, really just psychological abuse for two young girls. Um, mm -hmm. I, was, I was just kind of dumbfounded by that, but do you feel comfortable sharing that story with our audience? Yeah, later? I'll start and then I'll start and then Lisa can chime okay, in. Great. Um, our mom, yeah, our mom and stepdad just up and rooted us and moved us to Ohio in the middle of the night and he was running from the law or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but we went to stay with his uncle, his aunt and uncle, and we didn't realize that he was a practical joker at the time. I mean, we had no idea. Um, so their twisted mind in, in order to make us feel really um, glad that Santa showed up and brought presents, I guess the next day, um, they played a practical joke and um, were shouting obscenities i'll kill him if he shows up on my property and so they had the jingle bells they had the shotgun and caught the shotgun even shot the shotgun and you all i you know and then we'll bury him <laughs> i mean we really we thought that santa, santa was, was dead was dead and wow. you know we just we not we couldn't believe it and then immediately we thought it was all of our fault michelle that if we mm. weren't there santa wouldn't have died and how are we going to let other people know that santa died and you know it was even though it lasted one one only one night because we found out he wasn't really dead the next morning aren't you glad santa's not dead well yeah, yeah. i don't i mean it's wow. just it's unbelievable how somebody can rob even for a night a childhood dream, a hero as Santa. That's like our biggest hero when we're little girls or right. little kids, you know? So yeah, this is the kind of people that we were, were dealing with. Um, a very, you know, just twisted. And I mean, thank goodness Santa didn't die. <laughs> you know, right. know Santa right now, but it's just, yeah. you know, it was a night, it was a, it was a nightmare unfolding before us. Yeah. That Let alone we were in a strange house, mm -hmm. um, right. people that we didn't know, and they were like, the hillbillies. I mean, <laughs> yeah, had a so out, we had yeah. outhouse. I never seen what an outhouse looked like. Yeah, it was yeah, yeah. You, and the bottom line is, we didn't know what these people were capable of. You know, we had right. only been around, you know what I mean? We didn't have any idea. It's not like we had a relationship with these people and that we knew what, you know, what they were capable of. So, you know, what they did and they made it so real with all the props, they really kind of planned this out, you know, what they were going to do. So, yeah, you know, it's just one of those things, Michelle, psychological abuse, emotional, call it what you want to call it, but you know, it's right. pretty horrendous for little kids. They have to experience something like that. Sure. So, sure. And sometimes yeah. when people do that, you know, like, Oh, 
ha ha, Santa's not dead, then, and that you don't find it funny. It's like, well, you don't find that funny. It's your problem for not finding that funny. Right. And right, it's like, right, exactly. it's not funny because it's not mm -hmm. funny. It's sick yeah, to do exactly. that because exactly. I mean, if you look at most kids Christmas Eve, it's like a very, very special time, the anticipation and the joy and everything. And to have you literally up all night, not only concern for yourselves, but you know, Santa's not going to our friends' houses and everybody else because he's dead. Just awful, awful thing to do. Um, so Lori, again, you go into great detail about um, the different kinds of abuse that you endured. And again, it was not just psychological, it was emotional, physical, and sexual. Mm -hmm. um, we're not, we're not going to go into all of those um, at this time, but uh, is there one particular story that you would like to share with our audience just to kind of give them a picture of how difficult it was for you at the time? <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting that I could actually smile and laugh at it now. And that just tells you I've healed a lot. There's yeah. so many. This book is packed. It is. Examples and stories of what we endured. But the mm -hmm. one I chose right now was more uh, geared to um, towards humiliation. I was okay. a bedwetter and I was tortured by the step grandmother for wetting the bed. And you, you know, when you read about that, it's, you know, it, that's in itself. Mm -hmm. However, my stepfather, his way of curing me from the bedwetting was ask my sister Lisa to go get all the classmates, all the neighborhood kids to come and witness Lori on the sidewalk in a diaper. And with the pacifiers saying, goo goo gaga, they laughed. They thought it was the funniest thing. And mm. I was humiliated to the core. I think I even peed. You know what I mean? I was just, I was so humiliated. And so not only did I have to have to endure that incident, but I had to go to school and relive it every day because these kids would not let up on that. Right. Let's yeah. put it this way. Thank God we moved, Michelle. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I mean, there were a couple times I was so grateful that we moved, and this mm. was definite. Moved from Ohio was one, and this had, had to come in number two, was getting away from just the taunting and the, and the abuse of, um, you know, of, of reliving that humiliation. But guess what? It's kind of crazy. In the book, I even say, I didn't know whether to love him or hate him. I didn't mm -hmm. wet the bed again. I think my ego was so crushed that I couldn't mm -hmm. allow that to ever happen to me again. And so I just, I was, I didn't wet the bed again after that. So I didn't know whether hate him or love him or, or what. I mean, I was so confused. Right. It was a very difficult piece for me to write. I wept from the core of my being mm -hmm. when I wrote this piece because um, just the thought of somebody doing that just, and I was eight. So, right. you know, I was in a really vulnerable age then of wanting to my friends and, you know, and to be rejected and just, you know, all those things, if you could possibly imagine. And I, well, at least I want yeah. to chime kids, in. Kids don't, uh, kids don't need any ammunition when it comes to things like that. I mean, they, they will bully and make fun of kids. Um, but one of the things that's very clear in the book is the relationship that you two have. I mean, you're, you're two years apart. You endure these things together. Uh, Lisa was always there for you. You were there for her. Um, so Lisa, for you to have to participate in this by going to get the friends, I mean, Rob was making you do it, but talk a little bit about that and, and how this affected you. Well, um, it made me very sad to see my sister like that, mm -hmm. you know, but I knew when he told me to do something, I had to do it, you know, or there'd be consequences, mm -hmm. or I'd be in a diaper too. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. She'd be in a diaper too with me. Oh, but, I'm sorry for laughing, but, but anyway, that's yeah, good. That's good. It made me sad to see her right. go through that, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you can laugh about it now and that. <laughs> You know, you quit winning the it's bed. So that is a it's so ridiculous, It's so ridiculous. thing to do to somebody, yeah. just the humiliation, yeah. like you said. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things, Lori, that I like about the book is how you put in the chapter reflections. 
So mm -hmm. you're writing about past experiences, things that you endured as a child, and you, you do a very good job of describing that. Um, and I, I really, I, I mean, I just felt like I, I was there. Um, but then at the end of the chapter, you have a chapter reflection. And it's like you go back and look at these experiences that you endured as a child with the eyes of an adult, exactly. with a perspective, not only as an adult, but as a Christian, because you weren't a Christian at the time. And we'll talk about right. your faith journey later. But I, I just love that. I love that perspective. It's like it's like you're looking back and speaking to that child with with an adult perspective. So tell us how that came about, because I just think that that's such a beautiful part of the book. God, that's so awesome that you feel that way. Um, I'm going to backtrack for a minute and give a little backstory because cool. yeah. I initially I initially started writing this book in uh, 1980, no, 1997. Oh, wow. And the title, okay, the title of the book was Surviving Hell. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what it entailed. It was Vindictive Spirit get them before they get me. I'm going to expose their evil and wicked deeds to America and shame mm -hmm. them like they shamed me. And, wow. you know, there was, yeah, it was really ugly, Michelle. I mean, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I was writing it. I was getting like, I was enjoying writing it. Obviously I wasn't mm -hmm. a Christian yet, man. I was about for blood, right? I mean, right. you, know, you wanted, wanted to revenge when I got big. You wanted revenge. Yeah, I wanted to right. kill people when I got big, you know? Yeah. So this was my retaliation is, is mm -hmm. bringing shame to their name. Wow. And well, you know what happened? My house burnt down. Mm. So, you know, I could just see God up there going to no glory. That's not what you've been called to do. Well, I didn't have a clue right. what was going on. I was just really um, like, well, I guess I'm not supposed to write the book kind of attitude. Right. Um, 10 years later, uh, I end up picking up, I lost my job at the county at the time. And I thought, well, maybe I am supposed to write this book. So um, I named it entitled The Voice of the Weeping Willow. Well, guess what? That's what it was. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> oh, this happened to me and that happened to me. And oh, poor pitiful, pitiful girl, you know, um, which rightfully some of some of this stuff right mm -hmm. so anyways it goes to the editor an editor in new york and it came back rejected and she says lori i get it you went through this and you went through that you went through this. you went through some horrific ordeals right but what is the resolve what is the resolution in this what's the message did you forgive mm. did you heal what is your message and i'm like Healing? What's that mean? <laughs> you know? Yeah. What? I got to heal, you know? Yeah. So anyways, bought it. yeah. So, I mean, long story short, I went into deep depression. I mean, you know, we come from a long line of, you know, mm -hmm. anxiety and depression and all that and coming from my background. So, you know, I did, I could barely get out of the bed for the, you know, the next nine months and trying to figure out because I internalized that, that the book was not only a failure, but I was the failure you know okay. so i yeah, yeah and um so when i realized that the pawn was birthed and because of all this stuff and my stepdad teaching me how to play chess and i mean god kind of just opened the door to like whoa this yeah. can actually work and i didn't realize at the time but i had to i had to live out this book as i was writing it Right. I had to go through my healing journey yeah. while I was writing it. And why I was writing it, I was going through post-traumatic stress disorder. I was mm -hmm. constantly in the fight or flight. I was moody. I was loud, because I'm loud anyways and love it. Um, so I was <laughs> having all of these symptoms mm -hmm. as if I was going through it. Well, actually, I was reliving it for, for 20 years, you know. Right. I didn't realize at the time that I had to go through the healing process so the book can be what it is today. Amen. And, you know, and I look back at that, and you know what? I'll take it, because... Um, he is like, God loves me so much that he's like, yeah. you are not going to publish this book until you have a message of right. hope 
in healing on what I can do with a broken soul like yours. And you know, when I look at that, I just think that's so beautiful, Michelle, you know, it is. So that's where the chapter reflections come in okay. as I'm looking back, writing my childhood, I'm going through the motions of what I'm feeling and how mm. as an adult, how I can actually internalize and use my brain on terms of trying to put the pieces together and make some sense of it, you know? Right. And I was able to do that with the chapter reflections and using God's word to help me, to guide me through that. Yeah. Amen. So Amen. that's it. I and mean, that's that. Mercy Me has a beautiful song called Dear Younger Me. If you haven't heard it, maybe I'll, maybe I'll put a link to oh, it. I've heard it. It's a powerful song. Um, it reminds me of that um, because you're speaking to the younger version of yourself through those chapter reflections and they're just so powerful. Yeah. Um, perspective is huge. Not only the perspective of, of an adult, but the perspective of a Christian. And uh, mm -hmm. I love that. That was, that was a very, very beautiful part of the book. But what you said about, you know, first you wanted to write it basically to get revenge. Then you wanted to write it kind of from the perspective of a victim who was maybe still stuck in victimhood mm -hmm. a little bit. Exactly. And, you know, it wasn't time yet. And a lot of times God will give us a desire to do something like write a book or whatever the case may be. And it's just not time yet. And we want to stick everything in the microwave and God is saying, put it in the crock pot. <laughs> totally. totally. And so love that that, analogy. Yeah, that is, that is excellent. And, you know, I'm thinking of just some situations myself. It's like, oh God, I'm going to go do this or that. And he's like, yeah, how about we work on the skeletons in your closet first? I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> oh, okay. What? Sure. <laughs> that, sounds like, that sounds like fun. <laughs> But yeah, um, that it's such you know, a so painful it's, process. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. The yeah, freedom so that I, comes out of it. It is worth it. It's worth waiting and worth the healing journey. And like I've said many times before, we're not waiting on God, we're waiting with God. And so he's working in our lives. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you have this book running around full of revenge or full of victimhood, you know, it wouldn't be good. Uh -uh. It wasn't time. Nope. So nope. I, somebody who's watching tonight needs to hear this. Timing is critical when you are doing something with God. It's so yeah. important. And, mm -hmm. and it sounds like when the time was right, he was kind of downloading the ideas for the chess game and the pawn and all of it. And it fits all together. All of it. Perfectly. It just yeah. turned out Quick. exactly the way it was supposed to be written. Exactly yes. the way he wanted this book is exactly the way it was written. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, we try to kick doors down in our own timing and in our own power. And then God just opens the door and we just walk through. It's just so much easier to do it his way. But, you know, we don't always do it his way. I know. Um, right, right. But yeah, right. praise God for the timing and how everything fell into place. That is, mm -hmm. that's awesome. So a lot of times when, when bad things happen, like both of you have endured, uh, the question comes up, well, where was God when this happened? You know, where was God when, when your stepfather was doing what he did? And I just want to say for the audience, you know, if you're kind of thinking, well, if it was just the Santa story and if it was just the diaper, you know, it wasn't that bad. Well, she's giving you <laughs> little tidbits. The lighter versions, the more G-rated <laughs> or PG-rated versions. Um, so I recommend that you read the book to get a better understanding of what she actually endured. Um, and I know that she didn't even share everything in the book. So um, right. anyway, so, you know, the question is, and, and it can be an event. It could be a, a natural disaster. It can, it can be anything. If, if, if there's a God, why do bad things happen basically? Um, so how would you answer that? And I want to hear your perspective, Lori's as well as Lisa's um, because I think, from what I understand, we kept from two different, said, yeah. yeah, you, you had a different mindset back at, at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So for me, um, I just felt like God abandoned me. Well, let's back up here. First of all, I thought that my dad didn't love me because he left and he wasn't in my life. Mm -hmm. Number two, I thought my mom didn't love me because she allowed me to go through horrific torture and she witnessed it and failed to intervene. Mm -hmm. And 
And then it's like, well, if they, if they can't protect me and love me, how am I supposed to ex expect a God to love me? Mm -hmm. And because for kids, I guess we would interpret that, you know, uh, our parents are a reflection of God. And so for me, it was much easier to say there is no God was less painful for me to say that there wasn't a God than to believe that there was a God and he just failed to intervene and protect me and love me. Okay. Right. So I, I was a God hater. This one mm -hmm. here, God lover. I'm like, you're stupid. There is no God. <laughs> yada, yada, yada. Um, but this is the beauty in when we write our stories. I mean, I want to encourage everyone to write their story. It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. When I was writing my story, um, I realized that God was with me, you know, when the heat was on and they'll have to, they'll have to purchase the book to know what that mm -hmm. really means. When the heat was on, I thought he, he, he took, he abandoned me. But in reality, when I was writing, he allowed me to leave my body because the pain was so intense i mean mm -hmm. the pain was out of the world excruciating i can't even describe like every organ in my body wanted to jump out okay and this went on for uh for at least a year so this was not like a one-time thing mm -hmm. this was like this was like horrific torture like civil status stuff right mm -hmm. but what he did is i would leave my body and i could see if they call it disassociation, it's really common with really um, trauma, traumatic, like horrific abuse or torture mm -hmm. of any kind. And so, you know, I look at that as God was with me. He helped me go through that, endure that pain, that it wasn't, it could have been so much worse if I wasn't able to do that. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so he does a lot because this is the thing with God. He doesn't, he doesn't cause the um he doesn't cause the torture he gives us all free will right you know he gives everyone free will he didn't cause that but he helped me to endure it he helped me yeah. to survive it and live yeah. through it and heal mm -hmm. from it so i can share it and help, and, and help somebody else because you know what i am not alone in this michelle there yeah. are so many of us that have been tortured and i feel like I want to unify with all these tortured souls. I want us all to rise together and mm. to be victorious. Yeah. No more victim here, Amen. you know, and I think that's what my mission is. So in that, yeah, I grew up a God hater and, you know, and I was like that for many, many years. And, um, but it wasn't until I actually started writing and I had a spiritual experience too. And I'll talk about that, maybe talk about that, but that was an eye opener for me as well. But so he didn't really abandon me, really. Mm -hmm. um, he was always there. And I know that from the spiritual experience I had that I know without a shadow of a doubt, he went through it with me. He was there with me. You know, he felt Amen. it. He felt it too. So that's Amen. what I have to say about that. That's incredibly powerful, Lori. And then for you, Lisa, you just always believed in God or it seems that way through reading the yeah. book. And in fact, um, sometimes Lori would tell you to pray for different things to happen. So um, tell us a little bit about your perspective that even though you were in the midst of a very difficult situation, you, you knew God was there for you. Yes. I, I always felt that uh, he had my hand mm. going through whatever especially if she wasn't there because me and her we held on to each other mm -hmm. you know um i always felt that he was there you know with me i had a lot of guilt and sadness seeing my sister go through what she was going through mm -hmm. um she went through a lot more. I They babied me a little more. And that made me feel bad, too. Um, okay. It was, I guess, the psychological that you could part of it that I couldn't, you know, do anything to help her. Um, also, I wanted to mention, Lisa's a cancer survivor. She had cancer when she was nine. So right. she always felt that God um, 
was with her. She had a deep um, connection with God, you know, during the process that she had cancer. I don't think, you know, that's also in the book. Right. But, um, she says she's a cancer survivor when she was nine. And um, she just had a really deep faith in God, even though I tried to knock her upside the head and tell her she was stupid. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she continued on her, um, her belief in God. Yeah. So well, that didn't work, Lori, because Lisa was praying for you. So <laughs> I <know. laughs> nice try, but <laughs> oh, that's yeah, awesome. I, I know what it's like to have a sister that you have that faith connection piece with and, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I know that's why you wanted to bring her with you today. Yeah, for, yeah, for yeah, this yeah, us together. Even my little uh, cough drop message, it says we're stronger together. Yeah. This morning. <laughs> yes. It was a sign. It was a sign. Totally. I love it. God, God is amazing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, in asking the question, why did God allow this to happen? Or where was God when it happened? You know, God designed a family to be a mom and a dad and then have children together. And the dad is, is the covering and the protection. And in saying this, I'm not trying to bring condemnation for anyone or no, for anyone. Um, I've been through a divorce and it is not easy. Um, so I just want to, just to remind people that, you know, it was your dad's choice to leave. And it's like, you know, he's the covering. And when you take the lid off and you take the covering away, what's in the bowl is exposed to whatever. Whatever. Um, and that's the way it is, you know? So when we ask the question about why did God allow this or that, we have to remember that we have choices and other people okay. have choices. And unfortunately, we get the, the short end of the stick sometimes with the choices that other people make. Absolutely. Uh, the choices yeah, yeah, yeah. that your dad made, the choices that your mom made, the choices that Rob made, and so on and so forth. But then we also have to remember, well, I have choices. <laughs> I have choices to make in the midst of it. So um, talk a little bit about that as far as just how that situation plays into your story. Well, I think it was so easy for me. Um, I call it the blame game. Well, right. actually the my fault syndrome or the blame game, whatever, yes. whatever you want to call it. Basically, it's just keeping myself in prison by having that mentality because I was a magnet for my fault syndrome and it started really young. My dad left. It was my fault, right? Santa right. died our fault mm -hmm. uh the molestation my fault because i couldn't stop it i didn't say anything mm -hmm. um you know the lies that were told against me and i believed them as being real like i deserve punishment mm -hmm. you know i mean every little thing i just grew up oh being being called a garbage can like i was a piece of trash just to be thrown out like just the the, the worthlessness the devalued the degrading Michelle, I could go on and on and on about it, right? Right. But, and then in adulthood, what I would do is I would like pick choices of men to, for, it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So right. it would be repeated over and over. Like I would just be beat to a pulp. Well, guess what? If I would have got home an hour earlier, it wouldn't, I wouldn't have got beat. It was playing out in every situation Right. when it came to all the choices I was making. How about using drugs, not being able to stop and put my kids through all that. And not only that, Michelle, uh, being in a relationship with the man that murdered my daughter's father in front of us in 1989, blaming myself for that. Hey, I didn't pull the trigger, you right. know, blaming myself. If I didn't go back with him, that Nicole's father would still be alive. So, you know, it's just all of that is having that blame game, um, my fault syndrome. So, you know, later in life when I started, actually it wasn't later in life. It was actually, here I go again. This is when I started writing the book. Mm -hmm. When I really started writing the book, it's like when, on my chapter reflections that this is not my fault. Yes. I mean, I was a kid. I was a right. little girl. How can it be my fault for being molested? I was eight years old. My goodness. I didn't even have boobs. You know what I mean? Um, right. It wasn't my fault that my dad left, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like 
the pictures started opening to me. And then it st I started realizing that I need to be accountable for my own actions. Right. Um, that there was another situation that happened. But it helped me to realize some of the choices I was making that I didn't have to repeat that cycle. Because that's yes. what I was doing. I was the self-fulfilling prophecy of, of all my um, it's, it's, um, the self-destructive behaviors that mm -hmm. continued on to make my fault syndrome a reality and say, okay, so it must be. And so when I do more drugs, I sabotage myself, put my kids through hell, you know, on and on and on. So, yeah. Right. So again, it goes back to the book in healing through writing the experience. Yes, it's painful, right? But there's so much freedom that comes out of that. It's, it's Amen. incredible. Does that, that answer the question? It sure does. And, you know, I would encourage people, you know, maybe you never want to have what happened to you published or have it out there, you know, out in the universe, <laughs> but maybe just writing, maybe a journal. And through writing and, and scriptures and things like that, you know, God can heal that and Absolutely. realize that it wasn't your fault. Um, but, you know, how many Absolutely. kids think that, wow, if I'd just been a better kid, my mom and dad wouldn't have split up and, Absolutely. and just Michelle. all of these things. Well, so it's like adding mm -hmm. insult to injury that not only mm -hmm. do you go through this horrific experience, but now you have the weight of thinking that, that you caused it. Right. Absolutely. And so what does that do? I want to numb those feelings of feeling inadequate, right. devalued, unworthy. You know, I could just go on and on and on about all of the degrading and negative um, labels that I had within myself. You know, they say, uh, what is it? Self-limiting beliefs? No, mine, Lori's was self-destructive beliefs. Take it right. away, step way beyond self-limiting beliefs. We're talking about some self-destruction belief that I wasn't worthy for anything, not right. worthy for nothing, you know? So, so sure. yeah. Thank, and, and thank goodness. And I, I, and look what God's doing with this, you yeah. know? Yeah. <laughs> He's using it all. He wastes nothing. And I just love that you're coming forward with this because I think it's just going to help so many people. So thank oh, you so much so. for, for your honesty with that. Um, you know, we, we have to be very careful uh, not to blame ourselves, not to blame others, but then there's that fine line where we can take responsibility. Mm -hmm. I, I saw a quote someday or, or somewhere that said, um, what happened to you isn't your fault, but your healing journey is your responsibility. I did. I wrote that. When we partner with God. Awesome. Well, that's probably where I saw it, but I, I just <laughs> love that quote because it helps us to get unstuck and it helps us to move forward. And, you know, when we believe all of these lies, it's very mm -hmm. destructive. But when mm -hmm. we start to walk with God, he starts revealing truth to us mm -hmm. and it helps us to find freedom. So that mm -hmm. is incredibly, incredibly powerful. So you mentioned earlier you know, that you started drinking um, on your birthday, you know, smoking cigarettes, and you were introduced to drugs at the ages of like eight and nine. Um, mm -hmm. And this is kind of a, what I really want to zero in on today because I think it, it can shed a lot of light on what a lot of people who are struggling with addictions go through because you can detox somebody, right? And, and have them come out. But if they're dealing with all of this stuff, if they're dealing with all of this pain, and memories of things that happened, detoxing you can't detox that. fix anybody, right? And the only uh, way out is through. Yeah. Absolutely. The only way out is through. That's so good. And that's from Joyce Meyer, yeah. She Amen. Well, I I reached out to you when I heard about your book. Um, and I, I mentioned to you that I work with women who have life controlling issues, and a lot of them are stuck in um, addiction and human trafficking. And uh, what I discovered through the founder of the organization where I volunteer is that many of these women were abused as children, starting at about the age of four. And so, um, like, I, I, I heard the theory of that, right? But your book actually explains it. Like, your book connects the dots of how someone could be so horrifically abused. And then when you're introduced to drugs and alcohol by your family, 
right? I mean, yeah. your home, yeah. um, that you probably, you know, you felt relief or tell us about that. What, what were the drugs and alcohol doing for you at such a young age? You weren't even 10 years old yet. Yeah. Well, let's start out with eight first. Okay. Um, yeah. Eight was the cigarettes. I mean, I just wanted to fit in. I wanted to be cool. I mean, they had what they had the commercials with the ladies smoking and everybody was smoking. And I, I felt so low about myself that I would do anything to be cool. I mean, mm -hmm. we had people come over and they had the nicotine stained teeth and you know, what I mean, they smelled bad. It's like, I didn't even care because my need for approval yes. and my need to feel a part of, and that outweighed any any of the reality that was in front of me so yeah start smoking at eight um the 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 drinking um with the episode where my stepdad gave me the alcohol on my birthday i mean i just thought why in the world would anybody ever want to drink if you you know you pass out you throw up in your you wake up in your vomit mm. you don't feel good and you're hung over at eight years old and you miss your own party i mean come on you know right yeah. Um, but I mean, so that didn't, wasn't really, I didn't gravitate towards that, mm -hmm. um, when I was younger, um, when I was a little kid, but, um, when I was introduced to the drugs, so that was the cross tops, um, it's synthetic methamphetamine back in the day. It was like a really, you know, well-known, um, way to get high and like a meth. And so I, when I took my first pill, it was on. It was like, this is exactly what I've been needing my whole life. Like, oh my gosh, I felt powerful that I could go clean people's houses and I would be known as the cleanup woman. And I was somebody, mm -hmm. you know, in reality, I was somebody's slave. But to me, it's like, oh, they, right. they're appreciating me. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was, um, it, I would be numbed out. I wouldn't be able to think about all my problems. Mm. I mean, that's sad, Michelle, thinking about problems at nine years old, you know what right. I mean? But, yeah. you know, I thought I found all my answers was in this little pill. And when the little pill turned into two pills, ended up turning to Coke, you know, as an adolescent, and then gradually, I mean, methamphetamine was right behind it, you know? So, you know, I just thought that was the answer to mm -hmm. all my problems. And you talk about a lie, you know, yeah. it's like, it made my life like 10 times worse than what it was because it kept me stuck in my own prison, you know? Um, so yeah, it's like you said, for individuals, you can take away the drugs, but unless we start dealing with the trauma when we're younger, you know, it's just a matter of time. It has to be dealt with and it's painful, but there's freedom on the other side, you know? Absolutely. So did Absolutely. that answer? That it certainly answer? did. Yes. And, and I really don't know how to break free and heal from those traumatic and abusive experiences without God. I, oh, yeah. you know, I say it all the time. We've got to go back to the manufacturer. God created us and he can reach those places that we don't even know exist and help us to find freedom. So I'm so grateful oh, that you that you began that healing journey. But it really helps us to understand, like you said earlier, nobody aspires to being an addict when they're growing up, but it provided some relief for you. And um, and then as always, it escalates, right? Um, totally. it's, it, it, it goes deeper and darker and that's what the enemy does. Uh, we talk a lot about, I know when, when I was teaching school, you know, there would be different programs and things for drug education, but it was, you know, this is a gateway drug for that and marijuana is a gateway drug or whatever. And I'm just using that as an example, but what I'm hearing lately is the gateway is trauma. The gateway I, I, is abuse. You, you, you bet. And you nailed it. You nailed we it. Need that to, is, that's the root. Right. And we need to address that. And, you know, we know that addiction and life controlling issues are a huge problem in our country today. And everybody's trying to find a solution, find the magic pill to cure it, find the therapy, find the counseling or whatever. And those, some of those things, I guess, can be helpful at times, but at the end of the day, we need God. <laughs> we need God to heal those broken places within us. Absolutely. Yes. And so you really paint a beautiful picture of your healing journey in this book. And my prayer is that that will really help people who are on a similar journey because um, 
we need to have honest conversations. I mean, real talk yes. is a huge problem. And you walking through what you went through, um, there's a purpose in the pain. And part of that is for your own healing, but part of it is so that you can tell your story to other people and help them on their journey as well. Mm -hmm. So yay. Yay. Well done. well done. And thank you, God. So um, earlier you mentioned, Lori, um, that you had kind of a healing experience that kind of helped you. You said, well, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And I want to, I want to get to that before we close today. So okay. can you tell us about that healing journey that you went on that kind of helped open your eyes to some truths that God had for you? Yeah, you know, and this, I struggled with really putting this experience in the book because, you know, it just, it's, it was, okay, so people's experience, spiritual experience, it's not one size fits all. Right. You know what I mean? It's not yes. one size, and I mean, because mine was so intrusive, you know, in, in, in the way it played out, I was like, well, I was like, God, are you sure you want me to put this in there? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. So I'll paint the picture for you right now. The murder trial is getting underway. I'm like, we're like a week. Uh, it was getting underway. I am a witness in the murder and, uh, and I was stressed out of my mind and I was happened to be babysitting a family member and I was real critical. You know, I was like, I was telling the mom when she got there, I'll never babysit her again. She's coloring on my wall. She's a, uh, she's a terror, you know? And the family member said something to me and it wasn't out of anger. It was out of love. And she basically said, you know, Lori, we're all going through a really hard time right now. It was her brother that was murdered. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone, you know, behaves, you know, differently and they're just coping the best way they can. And, you know what? It hit me so hard that when they left, I felt so dirty, so ashamed that how could I say something that like that about a little kid, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had to go take the shower just to get the uck off me, right? Symbolically, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, just in my head. And it was like, I started I was so hurt. I started hearing everything I ever did in my life that was hypocritical. <gasps> I'm Whoa. like, I mean, let me tell you, Michelle, I was like, I mean, I was bouncing off the, I mean, because it was just, okay, all right. Oh, no. You know, it was like, it was deep. I mean, it was like traumatic, right? right? And, but what that did, because I took that, I was being revealed of who I really was. Mm -hmm. It hurt me so bad. It triggered all the childhood trauma wow. came rushing up. Like wow. I'm telling you, I could feel my little legs at six years old kicking. It's, it was, it was like an outer body mm -hmm. with, I could feel my legs like kicking, like, please stop torturing me. Right. Right. I, I couldn't take it. I could not take the pain. I, I, I just, I literally, I said, I cannot. And I died, not physically died, but I spiritually died. And it wow. was like, it was almost like I was crucified with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I heard his voice, like, forgive them, father. They not know what they do. Wow. And, and this was nothing I did. I mean, I mm -hmm. was in my addiction. I think I only had three days clean then. Right. Mm. I was, I was evil. I was mad at the world. I mm. mean, you know, I was making excuses. Like you went through my childhood, you'd be a drug addict too. I was defending my uh, drug addiction and, you know, and so he laid me out Wow. and he gave me, and, and see, and that's the thing, everybody, everybody experiences God differently, but listen, yeah. I come from a background with torture, long-term torture, that right. this was going to be the only way that God could get my attention, like the mm -hmm. only way, and it wasn't because I earned it, it's mm -hmm. because he had so much mercy for me and wow. compassion and yes. forgiveness that he's like, he does not want me to go to the hell I've been through my whole life. Amen. He wanted, he wanted to save me that I was worth saving. Yeah. I was born again and I was given a new heart. Michelle, I've never been the same since 
I had been, uh, let me tell you, I was at war with the, you know, the old me, you know, we're, we're going to battle. And then right. people that don't understand this are going to have a hard time understanding what right. I have to say. But let me just tell you, my life changed. It didn't change overnight, but I wasn't the same person, Michelle. She I was given a new heart. My sister's like, what has gotten into you? It's like your <laughs> prayers. Yeah. In Tennessee begging God, please save my sister. Yeah. She's going to die. And so yeah, she's yeah, over I there. Really yeah, she's over there in Tennessee, like on her knees every day in the church, begging wow. God to, to, to save me because Amen. I was going to die. And, wow. you know, it's, it's like everybody, you know, and one reason I want to share this as well. There's got to be somebody else out there, Michelle, that had the same experience as me. I am. Yeah. I just want to know that. I can't yeah. be the only one. Right. You know? And I think it's a part that we don't want to talk about because it's so revelational. You know? It's like, you know, people are really going to think I'm crazy. But you know what? Right now, I don't have any shame or guilt. I don't care what they think, you know? Amen. I don't care if they think. That. Amen. You when know? you get to that point. <laughs> when you get to it's that like, point. Yeah. It's a new level of freedom. I'm sorry, Lisa, what were you yeah. saying? If it reaches just one person, Amen. it'd be worth it. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. I agree. But I think it's going to reach many, many, many people. And that's what I'm praying for. Yeah, it's hard to put words into it. It's hard to put a spiritual experience into words. Because when it's God, it just words fail. But I remember now reading that part of the book and it was like, it's like this crescendo of everything that you've been through and everything God is meeting in this place. And it sounds like it really was a place of surrender for you oh, yeah. of, of really accepting God's gift of eternal life, of mm -hmm. his, his grace and merch, mercy, which are phenomenal. But it reminds me of one of my favorite scriptures, which is 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which says, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone. The yeah, new yeah, has come. Yeah. And of course, the symbol for that is the butterfly. And that is near and dear to my heart. So, oh, oh, yeah. oh, let me, let, let me just show you something. Look what we have here. Awesome. <laughs> my sister found this while she was getting ready and brought it. Perfect. Today. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. So um, we'll, we'll start to wrap up here, uh, ladies. But um, one of the things that I think we really need to discuss is the forgiveness piece. Um, because of what you both have been through, uh, you had to forgive your dad. Um, you had to forgive your mom. And um, your mom is no longer living. Um, but you you had to walk through forgiveness with her. And also, um, I know this one very well, you have to forgive yourself. And sometimes that's the hardest. Um, you had to forgive the people who hurt you, um, Rob and his family. Um, so talk a little bit about the forgiveness journey. Um, forgiveness is a huge part of being a Christian. We know that we've been forgiven, but we're also called to forgive with God's power working in and through us. So thoughts on forgiveness well you know what for me i in the book i think forgiveness is the largest chapter. i think it's the longest chapter yes. because i had so much to share about it and honestly i think it's the golden key to freedom you know mm -hmm. and it's it's like you know i buck this one how do you want me to forgive when they tortured me you know it was right. so difficult um so, but you know what? I heard my pastor say, and I don't know who came up with this quote, but I've heard it many times. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. I mean, when I actually heard that for the first time, I was like, mm. whoa, that's so profound and mm -hmm. so true, right? Um, so in order to, for me to go through that forgiveness process, first of all, I had to purge the poison. The mm. poison is all of the hatred it, actually it's the hurt really when you when you get the layers when you're hurt i mean when you you're angry and then you're bitter and you're all this but underlying all that is just deep deep rooted hurt and so to really purge that and really share like from my gut of the pain to mm -hmm. god which he already knew about it but he wanted me to express it right, right? 
And, and what I noticed is I could not forgive others because I couldn't get past my own pain. I mm -hmm. couldn't move past my own pain. And so when I got to that point, I just was in the, I was incapable of forgiving others. Right. Right. And when I finally got to a point where I knew, cause he ordered me to forgive and I, I don't want to, but I knew I had to, I had to, this had to be, this had to, this was definitely something that I had to do. Not because right. I wanted to, but because I had to, right. Mm -hmm. Um, I started dissecting, um, just going through like what my mom went through when she was younger, you know, she had the, um, unwanted spirit. Like my grandfather was upset that she wasn't a boy, you know, so she carried that unwanted spirit, her shame and her guilt and mm -hmm. the divorce and that label that she had right. to deal with having mental health. We have a long line of anxiety and depression. You know, what? back in those days, they didn't, they put them in the nut ward, putting them in on electric shock or something. Right. You know, we are so fortunate that I, I'm fortunate that I have medication and I'm an advocate for that because I really feel like it's helped me. Right. Awesome. And so when I begin to look at all these things on where my mom and then how she was a victim too, mm -hmm. I begin to really have so much compassion for her wow. and really be, was able to forgive her. and. You know, I have a regret though that my daughter told me, Mom, I give you permission to forgive yourself. Wow. So powerful. Wow. I didn't get the opportunity to tell my mom that. I did, because mm -hmm. you can imagine the guilt that she had allowing me to go through the heat and all that and wasn't able to protect me. You know what I mean? I could just imagine right. as a mom, you right. know, and feel in, in prison herself, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and a lot of the forgiveness, unfortunately, came after she had passed away. And I just wept, you know. And um, again, I put myself in my dad's shoes, too. He was 18 when he had me, you know. It's like he right. was out there chasing women or whatever he was doing, you know. It's like he was mm -hmm. a kid, you know. Yeah. I'm not making excuses for, for them, but I'm telling right. you, it helps. It yes. helps a lot to be able to release the anger and begin to forgive and to build a relationship have an awesome relationship with my biological father today we both do actually That's um, awesome. and you know and um you know and the fact that i can forgive in my heart like look i'm talking yes. about stuff that people don't even talk about right now right. i have no anger right no, you know what i mean it's yeah. like you know it's like i am totally free and I so appreciate, you know, but you know what I have to say? It took me 20 years to forgive. Right. <laughs> I kept yeah. myself locked in the prison for 20 years because I refused to forgive. My goodness, it's the best thing that I ever did for myself. Yes. Not for others, but for me. Absolutely. So, so it unlocked the door. The golden key unlocked the, the door. Golden the golden key. The golden key. Forgiveness is the golden, the golden key, key to the heart. And I can't express, and I spend a lot of time on forgiveness in the book, outlining in detail every scenario, even the right. problem list, even all of this stuff. Right. Um, because it's so important. I want people to get that. This mm. is like the, the golden key, man. I it love is. it. So, I yeah. love it. Well, you write about it very well, Lori. And, um, you know, it is a process. Forgiveness is not an event. It, it's not like right, flipping right. a switch and it's just right, boom, right. there it is. It, it's, it's a process, but it begins with a choice. Yeah. And we can invite God into the process. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same one who said, forgive them father, for they know not what they do as he was on the cross experiencing excruciating pain and humiliation. He lives in me and he lives in you and uh, he can help us through that process. So I, I totally hear what you're saying on every level. I know that it's not easy um, and it's especially hard when that person doesn't apologize or doesn't acknowledge what he or she has done. Right. But you right. know, we, we can't, we can't work it both ways. It's like, well, I want you to forgive me for what I've done, but I'm not going to forgive them for what they've done. It's like, 
I don't think it works right. quite that way. But I love what the Apostle Paul said. He said, forgive as you have been forgiven. And so Absolutely. when we have, know, when we really know in our heart, like you said, that we've been forgiven, then and only then, I believe we can begin the process of forgiveness. So if there's somebody here today watching and you're really struggling to forgive. You know what, Michelle, can I back people? up for one? Sure. Michelle, can I back up for one yeah. second? It's really important. I forgot about Absolutely. the importance of forgiving myself. Sure. It, that, that was the hard, that was the hardest yeah, for me I was agree. to forgive my, it was the hardest and, and I, and people, and I'm just sharing my own experience on my process. Right. I, I went through forgiving others first because mm -hmm. I couldn't forgive myself, you know, yeah. with the choices I made and with my addiction and all the stuff that I put my own family through. But it wasn't until I wept and really forgave myself because he God had already forgiven me with that yeah. experience I had, nice. yeah. but I wouldn't, ex I didn't accept it. I couldn't accept that he could love me and forgive me because I couldn't forgive myself. Mm -hmm. When I really actually forgave myself, when my daughter said, mom, I give you permission to forgive yourself. That kind of right. opened the door for right. me to forgive myself. Right. But that's when I fully understood that I was forgiven by God. Freedom. Mm -hmm. I was freedom. Yeah. Amen. And it is so hard, especially when, when we have done, made some horrific mistakes ourselves right. and carry on that, that guilt and that shame. And, um, I think that's the, probably the hardest for ourselves. Yes. Um, at least it was for me, but Amen. when I did that, it opened up freedom for, you know, I really know I'm forgiven. I have no doubt where I stand with God right now, Amen. you know, and uh, it's, it's yeah. like a weight. It, you don't realize right. that you're carrying this weight until it's off of you. And then, you know, mm -hmm. that, that you've been, it's carrying like, yourself. I feel like the book. I feel like the butterfly. Feel like the butterfly. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's so good. Yeah. So I just want to encourage people who are struggling with the forgiveness piece, whether you're struggling to forgive other people or whether you're struggling to forgive yourself or maybe a combination of both that um, invite God into that process and under help, you know, I pray that he would help you understand that you are forgiven and that you can forgive. And, and like I said, it's a, it's, it's not an event. It's a process that begins with a choice. So um, I've thoroughly enjoyed this interview with both of you ladies. Let's, let's go ahead and wrap things up. I want to give both of you an opportunity to share anything else that we didn't uh, get to cover today. Um, Lisa, let's start with you. Is there anything else that you'd want to share with our audience? I know you've been a great support for your sister. You've had the grace of faith from an early age. Um, and now you get to witness what God is going to do and how God is going to use all of this for his glory and to help people. Um, anything else you want to share today? Um, I, I would just say anybody that is going through any aspect of life's challenging, um, things to, um, just get the word of God, get it into your heart. Mm -hmm. And the, because the word is alive and mm -hmm. he will give you direction. Amen. Yeah. I agree with that. The word of God. I is truly, true. truly yeah. um, hold on to that. Amen. You know, and there's peace. There's peace in that too so true thank you for that lisa and thank mm -hmm. you for being here today lori mm -hmm. any final thoughts um you know i just you know romans eight twenty eight is my favorite scripture yeah. i think you went to my page and saw that and you go I wow did. i like yes, this i did okay. mm. this whole book is boils down to romans eight twenty eight, right um, that no, I want people to know, no matter what they've been through, the trauma, mm -hmm. the, all the rejection and all of the pain and the suffering and all of that. And not only those things, but the, the pain and suffering that we cause or they cause, right? right? That he can use all those things for his glory and his good. 
you know, um, we have to be willing, if we're willing to do the work, I mean, you know, it takes work right. and choices to heal and mm. to be able to share our stories. And, uh, but I always say, you know, I wrote this story. Uh, I wrote Lori's story for God's glory. <laughs> I love that. That is, that's perfect. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, for those of you that don't know Romans eight twenty eight, and I won't quote it perfectly, but it says, and we know that God works all things together for good for those who love him and for those who love him and have been called according to his purposes. And really you can sum that up in the subtitle, the curse becomes the blessing. I mean, that's, that's, it. that's yeah. Romans eight twenty eight right there. That is, that that is, is so is. awesome. So I will go ahead and I'll post links to this book. I highly encourage you um, to get this. If you've suffered through a trauma, or an abusive situation, or if you know someone who has, it will help you understand why people get stuck in cycles of destruction and addiction and things like that. And so I thank you so much for shedding light on that. I wanna thank you both for being here today. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, this conversation. I know we could just talk for hours, but I, I bless you on your journey. I pray that God opens many doors for you and um, I know that that is your heart's desire um, to see God flip it around. And that's exactly what okay. he's done. Yeah. So thank you both so much. And I want to thank our audience for watching this episode of Voices of Recovery. We're creating a safe place where people can go for support and encouragement on their journey with God. If you're new here, we'd love it if you give us a like or a follow. And if you feel led, share out this message. Because I think there's somebody you know who needs to hear what Lori had to say today. So God bless you both ladies and God bless I you. I wanted to say one last thing. Sure. Okay. You know, I've been healed when I can wear orange lipstick. <laughs> I know you'll have to read the book. <laughs> exactly. You'll have to read the book to know what she's talking about yeah, there. But amen to that. Amen. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, ladies, oh, and thank, thank you, you everyone, for watching. And we'll see you next time on Voices of Recovery. Bye-bye. Bye, Chuck. -bye. Bye, <laughs>